Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to the education channel of the New Books Network. I'm your host, Tom DeSena, from the Department of Communication, Journalism, and Public Relations at Oakland University. My guest today is Charlie Eaton, the author of Bankers in the Ivory Tower, The Troubling Rise of Financiers in Higher Education. Professor Eaton argues that while higher education has always played a crucial role in maintaining elite status in American culture, it has also been a way for Americans to transform their social and class status, and public universities especially have been a major stepping stone to new economic opportunities. He reveals in this book that finance is playing a central role in widening inequality, both in American higher education and in American society at large. With federal and state funding falling short, the U.S. higher education system has become increasingly dependent on financial markets and the financial organizations which mediate them. The turn to finance, however, has yielded wildly unequal results. Eaton chronicles these results with rich history, interviews, and numbers, making clear for the first time just how tight the links are between big finance and America's highly unequal system of higher education. Charlie Eaton is an economic sociologist and assistant professor of sociology at UC Merced. He studies the role of social ties, organizations, and politics in the interplay between financiers, other elites, and subordinate social groups. His work has been published in Socioeconomic Review, Politics and Society, the Review of Financial Studies, Sociology Compass, and PS, Political Science and Politics. Charlie Eaton, welcome to the New Books Network. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'd like to begin our conversation today by asking you what brought you to this project and, at least as importantly, what sustained you through it? Because I have to say that while the book is wonderfully written, it can also be a very challenging read. I found myself having to put it down every few pages as I became increasingly outraged at the role that finance has warped, how the how finance has warped the experience of higher education in this country. Yeah. Well, part of how I came to it is that I went to grad school um, starting in the fall of 2009, right on the heels of the global financial crisis. And we were still feeling the major aftershocks um, at the University of California. We had very large budget cuts um, and uh, due to the slow economic recovery from the, the crisis and uh, big tuition increases, increases in student loan borrowing, and um, and there was a lot of contention between uh, students and the people who ran the university, including a number of folks from Wall Street um, and from the financial sector on the UC Board of Regents. So a, a group of friends and I started kind of studying how it was that some of these changes in the way that we ran the University of California happened. And then I wanted to see how what we saw compared to what was going on in the rest of the country. And that's what led me to, to, uh, to start the book. And what kept me going was that even back then, um, as I was studying it, I was seeing people, um, people, including people, uh, who were really connected diverse groups that were connected by, um, by public universities were making change, um, in a positive direction to the higher education system. When I was in grad school and as I was working on the book, uh, the state of California decided to freeze tuition, a tuition freeze that's remained in place for 10 years. Um, and, uh, uh, there was also a major tax on millionaires passed in California and there was a major crackdown on predatory for-profit colleges that had been financed by private equity financiers. Um, and while all those things were going on, people were also imagining what has become the movement to cancel student debt. And we are now on the brink of canceling hundreds of billions of dollars in uh, student debt, freeing borrowers who have been harmed by a, an unfair student loan system. And, uh, and seeing that, that new idea develop and go from being, uh, being seen as a fringe idea to being mainstream has just been remarkable. 
Yeah, it really is astonishing. Um, and, and you talk about some of these things in the conclusion, which we'll we'll get to later on. Um, but let's start with uh, what you describe as the social circuitry of finance. What is it and how does it influence higher education? Yeah, so the social circuitry of finance is uh, it. The language comes a bit from Viviana Zelizer and Fred Weary, um, who they, they, they talk about social circuits um, in economic sociology where people negotiate the meanings of their, um, their economic uh, transactions and their economic lives. And one of the things that I point out is that a lot of economic life gets organized by a parallel social circuitry um, uh, or what I call parallel social organizations. So a lot of the social ties that people use in their economic lives come from country, especially among elites, country clubs, uh, opera societies, uh, elite cultural groups, and especially colleges. It's the place where we form where people become adults and they form lifelong friendships and they form powerful identities. So powerful that we, we put them on our resumes, but we also put them on our bumper stickers and then our, and on our, uh, our sportswear that we wear around for our whole life. And, um, uh, elites and especially financiers draw a lot on those social ties to, uh, to organize their social or to, to, uh, do their economic um, activities. And so, um, you know, one of the examples from the book is that uh, hedge funds really benefit a lot from the social ties that uh, hedge fund founders had from elite universities. And one example is Tom Steyer, who's a a well-known hedge fund fund billionaire. And he, uh, he learned in 1986 when he was trying to get his hedge fund off the ground, he went to a Yale home fun- homecoming football game and he learned that his fellow Yaley David Swenson had left Wall Street to go back to Yale and run Yale's endowment and that Swenson was starting to make hedge fund style investments. And so uh, Tom Steyer went and got a meeting with Swenson and pitched him on investing in his hedge fund. And Swenson was at first cautious. He said, well, you know, how do I know you're not going to close down? These hedge funds are these new risky things. And uh, Steyer made him a promise that he wouldn't close down if he had a bad year and, uh, and, and that uh, he would waive some of his fee for the first two years. Um, and Swenson said, oh, okay. And he gave Tom Steyer $300 million in Yale endowment capital, which was a third of of Steyer's in initial capital and was really crucial to him becoming a billionaire. And it all started at a Yale homecoming football game. Um, and, and the Yale identity and Yale connections ran throughout that really critical transaction in the f- founding of one of the first successful hedge funds. I, I guess this is, this is part of what I mean by, you know, the, the book was a challenge to read because you had to put it down. I, I have attended uh, uh, championship football games for one of my alma maters frequently, and I've never once run into someone who uh, made me $300 million. I, I feel really kind of left out. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of folks, you know, the counterpoint that we can talk about a little bit later is, you know, people in California, a lot of the folks who ended up, um, uh, who ended up, brainstorming the tuition freeze and pushing for it politically and figuring out how to pay for it with a millionaire tax were people who were connected by having gone to university of California schools and stayed connected by going to homecoming football games, but they came from a much wider swath of society. Um, and, uh, and they weren't hanging out together just in the, uh, in the VIP boxes. It's a big distinction. Uh, So you go on to describe what you call our new financial oligarchy. So who are these folks and uh, how does higher education serve their interests? Yeah. So the new financial oligarchy talks about how finance kind of got reorganized in the 1980s. And again, uh, higher ties to higher ed played a big role in this reorganization. Um, Traditionally, you know, the, the original phrase 
our financial oligarchy comes from something that um, uh, Supreme Court Justice Brandeis wrote before he was a Supreme Court Justice, mainly about uh, uh, J.P. Morgan and the Money Trust back in, I think he wrote that in 19, 19, the 1910s. Um, and so it was about investment banks primarily. Um, and investment banks got heavily re- regulated after that um, to kind of break the power of the money trust um, and stayed pretty regulated until the 1980s. And then we had a big financial deregulation in the late 1970s and in the early 1980s. And investment banks have stayed important, but people particularly coming out of investment banks use these these. Uh, financial deregulations and their Ivy League ties to start these new types of investment funds that have become extremely powerful in the economy, particularly private equity funds and hedge funds. And what made them new was that they could borrow amounts of capital uh, at um, uh, 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 that previously you really couldn't do. There was changes to regulation that made it more possible to borrow huge amounts of money using derivatives and junk bonds. And then you could borrow that huge amount of money and you could invest it in something. In the case of a private equity investor, what you do is you buy a whole public company. So this is like the corporate raiders of the 1980s, like Carl Icahn, um, uh, folk, the folks who bought up Transworld Airlines and, and, uh, pulled it apart. It's folks like Mitt Romney, um, uh, who did this for Bain Capital. And you'd buy a whole industrial corporation. This happened to RJ Nabisco. And you'd try to break the union once you buy the company. You take it private, which is what Elon Musk is trying to do to Twitter right now. You take it private. You do a bunch of stuff to try to make it more value, more profitable and more, more valuable. Often that includes uh, union busting, uh, factory closures, um, sometimes some technological investments, and then you sell it off once it, it's more profitable, or you break it, break it up into pieces and you sell it at, at uh, a larger sh- cost than you bought it. And it really wasn't possible to do that until these financial deregulations. Um, and it also wasn't as lucrative to do it because these huge tax cuts at the end of the 1970s in the beginning of the 1980s meant that the private equity investors who did this could keep really large parts of the profits as after tax income before then a lot of the income would have been taxed at, at rather high tax rates and so they became very powerful in the organization of the economy hedge funds also happens hedge funds are a little different than private equity um, private equity you buy whole companies and then you hold them as private assets that are what we would call non-liquid, non-liquid in that you can't just go sell a company that you've taken private. You can't sell a stock of it in, in on the stock market. Hedge funds tend to inv- invest in stocks and derivatives um, that you can trade at any time on a, on a market. Um, but they use the same kind of financing techniques and they have the same kind of uh, – very lucrative fee and structure fee structure. And so these folks in private equity and hedge funds, they become the new super rich, the new JP Morgans. And you can see this by looking at the Forbes 400 list of, of the wealthiest Americans. And they go from making up, uh, you know, a, a small fraction of the Forbes 400. They basically don't exist in 1980, 1989. They make up something on the order of 7% of the Forbes 400. And, uh, and my recollection is that they just the private equity and, and hedge fund managers get up over 20% of the Forbes 400 in, um, by 2017. Um, and, and last but not least, they tend to have Ivy League degrees at really high rates. In 2017, about 65% of the private equity and hedge fund billionaires on the Forbes 400 have, have, elite university, elite private university degrees. And that's very interesting because there are some other people on the Forbes 400 that you would also expect to have elite degrees at high rates. For example, tech billionaires. But if you look at tech billionaires, 
it's actually only around 30 or 35 percent of them that have these Ivy League degrees or other elite private university degrees. And that's similar to, to the overall average of, um, of all billionaires on the Forbes 400. And so th- that's kind of one way to see that for these, n- this new financial oligarchy, your Ivy League ties are really important. Um, and it's not necessarily because you know you're smarter, you know something more from, from being on the Ivy League or have, from going to an elite school. If that were the case, we'd probably expect more elite educations to be a pre- pre- just as much a prerequisite for the tech billionaires. Um, but it's because the, you really need these connections, the private information on, uh, on what's the good, the good financial bet to make. You need the private information from uh, elite Ivy League networks and you need um, those connections to raise capital. And so that's why it's particularly lucrative to have those kinds of degrees. So essentially we're back to the uh, Yale homecoming game. Back to the Yale homecoming game. Yeah. And in a way back to 1914, JP Morgan, um, (laughs) you know, I I compare the statistics today to, uh, to statistics that, um, uh, that C. Wright Mills uses and his 1956 power elite about investment bankers and uh, that, um, uh, and that I, th- that he also takes from the book Lords of Creation about the kind of J.P. Morgan era folks. Um, and th- they look very similar. Um, so in some ways, it's, it's what we've always had with this strong tie between finance and elite education, but just a little more. <laughs> just a little more. Uh, in the third chapter, you describe the turn toward student debt as a funding mechanism for higher education. Now, most people are certainly aware of the effect of student debt, but can you tell us a little bit about how this shift from public finance took place and uh, the political decisions that led to it? Yeah, uh, sure. And if folks are looking for a quick read, I've got a a op-ed in the New York Times last week with my collaborators, uh, Amber Villalobos and Fred Wary, in which we tell a good part of this story. Um, so if you want the 1200 word version, I strongly encourage folks to look up that, um, our op-ed in the New York Times uh, about, um, uh, I believe the, the title of the, the op-ed ended up being about students needing a bailout. Um, our student borrowers needing a bailout. Um, and so what we tell is that student loans are not something that have always been a big part of the higher education financing system. In the 1970s, only one in eight uh, college students had any student debt at all. Um, and when they borrowed, they tended to borrow less and they t- tended to be able to repay it faster. And two things then changed. Um And they changed at the beginning of the 1980s. And then that had some uh, sort of domino effect. Um, So the first thing is in the 1970s, one of the reasons so few people had student loans is that we had extremely generous financial aid in the form of Pell Grants, not just for low-income students, but also for middle-income students. And so Pell Grants, which is our main kind of grant aid, you could get those if you were a middle income student and those grants covered 80% of the cost of attendance for the average public university. Meaning there were many public universities and community colleges where you could really go debt free just with a, a Pell grant and it would cover not just tuition, but a good chunk of your room and board costs. Um, and then we have the, the 1980, um, recession and the election of Reagan and two things happen at once. The first is, uh, a lot more students start going to school and using Pell grants and especially a lot more students from low and middle income backgrounds. Um, because, and part of this is because we're getting the first wave of major job losses from, factory closures and from union busting 
And so folks say, wow, the blue collar path to economic stability is not there anymore. We, we got to go to college and we're being told we should go to college. And so we're going to do that. But that starts to make the cost of Pell Grants way more expensive. So, you know, just as uh, Reagan is sending a message to workers that the blue collar path is not a viable one by by him busting the air traffic controllers union and um, and breaking the air traffic controller strike. He turns to Pell Grants and he persuades Congress to radically slash Pell Grant, Pell Grant awards and Pell Grant eligibility. And so we we literally cut Pell Grant spending per student, I think almost by half in 1981. And the higher education system kind of limped along in the 1980s. More students went to school, but everybody was struggling to pay for it. And so we then get to 1992 and the bankers come along. And I, that chapter I titled Bankers to the Rescue because the, the bankers come along and they say, hey, we got a solution. This will work for everybody. Um, you don't have to figure out a way to pay for more Pell Grants like you used to. Everybody can just take out loans. And a bunch of people, including Bill Clinton, jump on board. Uh, Bill Clinton says, we're going to throw open the doors again to the sons and daughters of stenographers and steel workers to go to college. Uh, everyone can go to college uh, with a loan that you borrow, but you've got to pay it back. And a bunch of promises are made about these student loans. Um, and these student loan programs, which are radically expanded in a sequence of legislation in 1992, 1993, and 1995. And those reforms to the student loan system radically expand student loans. And, uh, and we go from having flat borrowing at $20 billion annually throughout the 1980s to having a quintupling of uh, total student loan borrowing to almost $120 billion at the peak for new borrowing in 2010. Um, and bankers really wrote the reform. Um, they wrote a good bit of the reform, particularly the expansion of eligibility and the increasing of the limits on how much people could borrow. Um, and, uh, and people saw it as a, well, this is an easy solution. What could possibly go wrong? Um, and, We'll get into this more probably when we get to the last chapter of the book, but uh, a whole lot went wrong. Um, uh, borrowers were saddled with far more debt that they could repay. Uh, we still have 4.4 million borrowers who have student debt from the 1990s. Um, and uh, and the, the burdens of uh, who the debt has fallen on has been disproportionately people from low wealth backgrounds and especially black borrowers in part because of the racial wealth gap, um, which makes it, it requires black folks to go to college to borrow much more. Um, and it makes it harder to repay the loans once you've got them. So uh, in the next three chapters of the book, you kind of chart the influence of finance on three different tiers of higher education. We'll start with uh, where we start with the elites. What are these institutions and how has finance influenced them? Yeah, so the analysis in particular is of the top 30 um, private institutions, and I compare them to the top 30 public institutions, mainly to show that the top 30 private institutions look a lot different than the top 30 public institutions and in that they don't really enroll anybody, <laughs> at least for their undergraduate programs. Uh, undergraduate programs at the top 30 privates tend to be very small whereas top 30 publics tend to have very large um, and much more economically diverse undergraduate programs. And it's been boom times for the top 30 private universities and especially boom times for the big four of Harvard, Princeton, Yale, and Stanford, where these ties to financiers and uh, has been, ex has been highly mutually beneficial. Um, so, it wasn't just that financiers were helped by their ties to get their hedge funds and their private equity um, funds going. They then managed large parts of endowment portfolios that were invested in them, and they earned high rate, very high rates of return. 
and I get a little bit more uh, precise. I use some better school level data um, that uh, that I actually saw Thomas Piketty first used in his book Capital um, to show it, you at the top at the big four you get almost a ten percent average annual rate of return on investment uh, for the last four decades, um, which is much higher than the annual rate of return for most other schools. And I showed that it's not just that the endowments were big to begin with, which was the, the main thesis that Piketty had. He's right about that, that it, size helps because you can negotiate for a better rate of return and you can get access to the best fund managers, but it's also the connections to how many financiers do you have on your board? Um, and those social ties to elite financiers tend to get the endowments better rates of return at the elite schools. Um, and, uh, you know, so, you know, one of the things that I talk about is that Leon Black, um, uh, um, for example, um, of, of hedge fund uh, and private equity, Infini is set on the board of Dartmouth. And Dartmouth invested in his his fund at the same time that he was on Dartmouth's board, but the same was true for uh, for at least um, uh, for several other of the Ivies. Um, which you'll have to read the book to get the full list. But it's it's surprising how many of the Ivies all had had uh, had elite investors on their board that they invested with their funds at the same time. And then, and, and how does that then change the? What does it do to the institution itself? Like I, one of this, one of the things that surprised me is you know every every year we hear about the uh, uh, tuition at Harvard or something like that, and and your book points out that while the tuition is in fact exorbitant, it, the Harvard is actually spending more to educate students than than they're recouping in tuition. Yeah. So um, the main thing is so. If you go from uh, Princeton's a good example um, because Princeton, there's no medical school or business school or uh, or law school to complicate things. But Princeton's endowment has gone from it basically increased tenfold from around three billion ish in the seventies to I think over thirty billion today, if I recall, and. Uh, but Princeton enrollment has only increased around 30%. And so what that means is that Princeton has this huge endowment and schools tend to spend about 5% of their endowment assets annually um, on university operations. What that pencils out to is that Princeton spends about $100,000 per student on university operations every year. Um, and that's many times more than it used to spend in the 1970s, but it still has a very small undergraduate student body. So one way to think about it is that these resources are getting hoarded um, for the benefit of mostly pretty well-off um, students, particularly on the undergrad side. And uh, so it's good to link this endowment phenomenon to studies like the the Raj Chetty at all study that have shown that among 38 top universities, uh, uh, students from the top 1%, more students from the top 1% of the income spectrum enroll as undergrads at those schools than the entire bottom 60% combined. Um, so if you, we wanted to use these resources for more equity, Princeton would need to not just enroll a more diverse student body, you need to really enroll a larger student body um, along the lines of some of the bigger mass public universities. And so imagine if Princeton doubled its doubled its enrollment. That would mean instead of spending $100,000 per student, it would spend only $50,000 per student on university operations annually. And just like it did in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, much higher than what it spent in the 1970s and 1980s per student. So I think Princeton could still provide a world class education if it if it, <laughs> it only spent fifty thousand dollars per student instead of hundred thousand from the endowment. Yeah. So uh, 
Perhaps the, the most uh, heartbreaking chapter of your book deals with for-profit higher education. And um, the stories you recount in this section are, are just, they're, they're just devastating. Uh, can you describe one of the folks that you interviewed and, um, and talk about how finance created problems for these people? Yeah. So uh, Kim Tran is one of the people who I interviewed. Um, her parents uh, were Vietnamese refugees um, who never went to college. She grew up in Rhode Island um, and uh liked art in high school, didn't know what she wanted to do with her career. Um, and, uh, and she grew up about 15 minutes away from a guy named Jonathan Nelson, who is Rhode Island's only billionaire and is the, uh, founder and, uh, and head of the, um, Providence equity capital hedge fund. Um, and he's also on the board of Brown university and has donated a bunch of money to Brown. Um, and is an avowed education philanthropist. The Recreation Center at Brown is named after him in honor of a $25 million donation he made to Brown. And you would think that Kim Tran would be the kind of person that Jonathan Nelson would want to help as an education philanthropist. But the way that um, Kim was touched by Jonathan was very substantial, but it was not positive and it was not through his philanthropy. Um, essentially what happened is that Kim ended up getting recruited by recruiters for the, uh, art institutes chain, which Jonathan Nelson's firm together with Goldman Sachs purchased in the largest ever leveraged buyout of a for-profit college chain in 2006. And a couple years after that, um, uh, one of the recruiters, uh, that they were, pumping money into, to ramping up the recruitment and running up their enrollments. One of the recruiters in Kim's word called her every day. Um, and to, until she agreed to come and enroll at the art Institute and she thought she'd be able to do something in the area of applied art that was of interest to her. Um, she racked up $30,000 in debt, even though her parents were very, uh, averse to taking on debt and very worried about it and ended up not getting a degree because uh, the over enrollments at these schools and the, the cuts to programs implemented by the private equity investors as sort of the, as part of the private equity playbook um, just eviscerated the quality of the education somebody could get at art in, at the art Institute. And um, so she ended up leaving with no degree, $30,000 in debt that she still has to this day um, and that she's not been able to repay. And in fact, her debt has been growing because she's in an income-based repayment plan in which we capitalize the interest on the loan and the the balance expands um, because there's more interest than the payments that she's able to afford. And, uh, And Jonathan Nelson ended up you know, he's still a billionaire, still on the board of Brown. Um, he had, he actually had capital, um, in his and Goldman Sachs and investment firm from, uh, more than a dozen different college endowments when they did this buyout. So this is kind of an example of how the top of the education system, the uh, via endowments is connected to the bottom often in ways that people who, even people who run endowments don't, understand there was no willful desire to rip off for-profit college students by uh, the people who ran the endowments or the universities that invested in this leveraged buyout Um, because often you don't know exactly what the money is going to be used for what kind of leveraged buyouts are going to happen but it ended up very badly for kim and for many other students edmc went on to collapse in bankruptcy after the department of education withdrew its eligibility for using federal student loans to enroll students. Um, and, uh, um, and it's, you know, it's been the, the subject of multiple lawsuits. Yeah. It's, it's a, as I said, it's, it's a, it's a devastating chapter to read the, the stories that you recount, uh, are just, you know, again, heartbreaking. So in the, the next chapter, uh, and this is, of course, particularly interesting for me, uh, we have the vast middle. 
of institutions. Um, you use the University of California system as a representative, but we're really talking about a broad swath of public higher education. So let's talk a little bit about uh, how finance has squeezed this portion of the higher education market. Yeah, so the squeeze here starts, <laughs> again, the squeeze on the middle is connected to the top and the bottom. It's the, the top and the bottom that are squeezing uh, the middle in the first place. And how does that happen? Well, when people make a bunch of donations to endowments at the top, and when Harvard and Princeton and uh, Stanford and Yale get to make 10% investment rates of return, they get to do so with their investment returns exempt from taxes. And in fact, they do a bunch of things to manipulate tax law to uh, to not end up being treated by as a as an investment fund um, as they would be because they're earning such large investment returns, um, they have to do some very peculiar things like use tax blockers and essentially offshore some of their investment activities um, to make the kind of returns that they're they're making. And so there's a bunch of tax avoidance involved there. There's also a bunch of tax avoidance for people who make donations to those schools. They get to deduct those taxes. And um, and uh, also part of the reason that endowment returns are as big as they are is that there's lower taxes on the, the hedge fund managers and the private equity um, fund managers themselves, and they can pass on a share of their untaxed uh, income and returns to the endowments. So the the avoidance of taxes that benefits the top comes at the expense of the middle. Um, and uh, you know, one estimate is that tax expenditures, just federal direct tax expenditures for uh, endowments at the top, is around twenty billion dollars annually. Um, then at the bottom. For-profit colleges sucked up masses of amounts of subsidies from both Pell Grants and federal student loans. At their peak in 2010, they were using about 25% of the $120 billion in federal student loans and about $10 billion of the $40 billion or so in Pell Grant spending in 2010. Um, and, you know, those federal student loans that happened in 2010 have generally been money losers, especially at for-profit institutions. So there's a, a budgetary expense that's going to for-profits. Um, and those are all resources in the tens of billions of dollars, both at the top and the bottom that could have gone to publics in the middle. Um, and we actually got a bit of an experiment with that when we ended the subsidy to banks um, who were making a good chunk of federal student loans up until 2010. And what the Obama administration did was when they ended that subsidy to banks, which cost about $6 billion a year, they used it to increase Pell Grant expenditures, that savings. And so that helped fund more students to go to community colleges and public universities in the middle. So it, it's, you know, this really is money that gets moved around between the systems. It's, it's complicated, but it is, there are trade-offs. Um, and, uh, and so these public universities squeezed in the middle, a big part, a big thing that they then do is they turn to um, student loans, um, especially as state funding cuts accelerate. They turn to student loans to charge higher tuition and room and more board costs to make up for lost state appropriation revenue. And, um, and so that creates a, a squeeze on students in the middle. And these are the schools that are increasing enrollments um, while uh, the elite private institutions continue to keep their, their enrollments very low. Uh, <laughs> so that they can keep their, their rankings very high because just how few people you admit relative to your applicants is a major factor in our college rankings. Yes, yeah, I, have the, I work for the university where I earned my undergraduate degree. And uh, I always go to, I use the university's data to show my students this, that you know, when I graduated in 1988, the state of Michigan funded about 70% of what it cost to educate me. 
And then if we go to like the, the last year, 2020, I think the data is available. Uh, for them, the number is something like 28%. Um, and, and basically, you know, what it costs to educate someone hasn't really changed all that much. It's just where we go looking for the money. Yeah. And if you'd gone in 1979, um, you know, the state of Michigan would have paid for 80 percent of what it costs to educate you and you would have gotten a grant to cover most of your cost of living. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so in the conclusion, you talk about some of the ways that we might reimagine the financing of higher education uh, to better serve the needs of a, of a multicultural democratic society. Can you fill us in on some of what you see going forward as ways to resist the influence of financiers in the provisioning of higher education? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think there's there's two kind of big ideas that have come about um, in the last decade. And one is debt free uh, higher education for students moving forward. And the other is debt cancellation. And you really need to do them both. Um and the sequence in which we should do them has become increasingly clear. Uh, we should cancel debt first. And the reason is, is that it can be done by executive order. Um, so unlike expanding Pell Grants um, to, and restoring them to cover uh, most of the cost of going to a public university, um, uh, debt can be canceled under the Higher Education Act by executive order by the president. And we've seen this in part in that uh, this executive authority has already been used to cancel debts for uh, hundreds of thousands of defrauded for-profit college borrowers and for folks who uh, had not received promised relief from programs like public service loan forgiveness. Um, and I do believe we are on the verge of President Biden canceling um, somewhere between ten and fifty thousand dollars in student debt per borrower, which will amount to hundreds of billions of of the uh, total in, of one point six or one point seven trillion dollars in federal student loans. And to my mind, that then puts Congress on notice and ratchets up the pressure on everybody as a society and a polity to get debt-free college done um, because we're saying, look, we can't keep paying for school with student loans um, and just keep clicking the reset button uh, every five or 10 years by canceling large amounts of student debt. We need to have a debt-free system moving forward. Um, and I also think it will be a real political winner for Democrats if they cancel student debt. One way I think that we've gotten a preview of this is if, you, if you're if you a real watcher of, of folks, as the over the last year and a half, as we've seen hundreds of thousands of people get their, um, get debt cancellation, the targeted debt cancellation that President Biden has done, the amazing emotional expressions of relief and liberation from people who have had their debts canceled, um, testimonials from teachers about logging into their student loan, their federal student aid account, and seeing that their balance went from $100,000 to zero and uh, crying, and, crying and dancing in their classroom uh, while the kids are at recess. That's the kind of testimonials we're hearing from people as their debts are canceled. You also see it in a couple of instances where folks have announced, for example, at, at HBCU graduations that a wealthy alumnus is paying to uh, cancel all the students' debts for, for the graduating class. You see similar outpourings of elation. And so imagine that happening for 40 million people all at once. Uh, 40 million adults who all have family members. Um, it's something that would touch the lives profoundly of a huge swath of society in a society where 63% of adults now attend at least some college. Um, and so imagine everybody logging in 40 million people on the same day, or maybe it's a hundred million people if they get one of their family members to log in with them and watching their balances go to zero or be cut in half if they've got a very large balance. 
and then imagine uh, imagine how <laughs> folks will remember, oh yeah, President Biden was the president who transformed my life by canceling this debt that I never thought I'd be able to pay off. Um, and so I think that it could really have a, a, a major impact on, uh, on some of the upcoming elections. Debt-free college is not going to happen as long as there is an obstructionist uh, Republican um, uh, majority in Congress. So it will take a Democratic trifecta with a larger um, a larger majority than the, the current razor-thin Senate majority. But I think that canceling student debt, for the reasons I've just described, is going to make that majority, that Democratic trifecta, happen again sooner and to make it more ready to act to create the debt-free college system that we need moving forward. Yeah, although, I, I mean, I certainly support that idea, although um, at the same time, we're going through a gubernatorial election here in Michigan, and uh, at least some of the Republican candidates for that position have already made uh, a platform out of essentially zeroing out the support for higher state support for higher education. Yeah, no. And that's part of the, you know, <clears throat> so these debt free college plans, the devils are in the details. Um, but a lot of them involve a greater federalization of higher education funding, which is analogous to what we've done with our healthcare system. And it's much more stable and, uh, much more durable to have a strong federal commitment because that's where a lot of the fiscal power is in the United States. It's, it's with the federal government, not with the states. And so having locking in uh, larger federal funding for free college and debt-free college with state matching requirements um, along the lines of the, you know, the supercharged Medicaid that um, the Affordable Care Act created in 2010, like a version of that, um, is likely to, I think, make the politics of funding higher education in the states much more stable and durable, even in purple states like Michigan and even in um, e even in red states like Wyoming. You know, Wyoming is a very red state, but is actually pretty generously funded its, its higher education system in the years when it's had boom times from, from, uh, from shale oil. So as we wrap up today, I wonder if you can tell us what we might expect uh, next from you. Uh, what, what are you working on now? Yeah, I've got a series of papers that are going to be, um, we're going to be rolling out. We've started this higher education race in the economy lab um, here at UC Merced. Uh, me and my uh, my collaborator Laura Hamilton have founded founded the lab, and we've got a great team of postdocs, including Amber Via Lobos and Christian Smith, a couple great grad students, um, Heather Daniels and Alicia Jones, um, and we're going to be rolling out a set of papers and issue briefs in the coming year around uh, uh, <clears throat> two kind of two main areas of um, research. One is regarding the rise of online education and uh, particularly how public and nonprofit universities have ramped up their online degree programs primarily by using for-profit subcontractors, which in some cases are the same companies that ran predatory for-profit colleges, Title IV for-profit colleges. And the explosion of those enrollments and the the um, segmenting and segregating of a set of students into those online degree programs, we kind of theorize as a form of predatory inclusion, and we show that it, it's got disastrous implications for vulnerable students. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that we show is that these online programs have grown uh, to enroll around 2 million undergraduates, which is equivalent to for-profit the for, Title IV for-profit colleges at their peak. So this is the next, if we don't get ahead of it, this is the next um, predatory um, debacle, um, and it implicates our, our public and nonprofit institutions um, uh, 
much more than the, the for-profit college scandal. And the second thing is figuring out ways to, to redo our financial aid programs to account for the racial wealth gap. Um, and so that's, we hope will be a, a service to the project of creating debt-free um, college plans moving forward to make sure that we're delivering enough uh, financial aid to low wealth borrowers, including most black borrowers to make sure that they can succeed in college and, and leave college debt free. Um, so those are a couple of our, our, uh, our, um, our major, uh, threads of research. And, um, and I'm also interested in, in looking at ways that university ties get deployed, uh, university and finance ties get deployed in other sectors of the economy. Um, so, so plenty to do. The list is long, um, but we'll get to it all in time. Very good. Well, Charlie Eaton, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Tom. Uh, once again, my guest today has been Charlie Eaton, the author of Bankers in the Ivory Tower, The Troubling Rise of Financiers in Higher Education from the University of Chicago Press. My name is Tom DeSena, and you are listening to the New Books Network.